Okay, today we're going to take a break from our oneness series and I'm going to give you a Father's Day message today. The Lord has led me to do. I'm not doing it just because it's Father's Day. I don't have to give a Father's Day message on Father's Day, but the Lord's led me to do today. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 18. The first thing we're going to talk about is the purpose of fatherhood. <clears throat> I truly think one of the main purposes of fatherhood, if I meditate upon this topic, is that us as men who are fathers we can relate to the father. And that we can know what he goes through. That we can become more like him. I know what it's like to be like him. On Genesis 18, verse 19, we have the situation of the Lord coming down. This is a Christophany, I believe, where Jesus is in the flesh. He's called Yahweh because he is God in the flesh. But this is not his permanent time he's coming in the flesh like he did at the beginning. Or he did later on when he came as a virgin, born of a virgin. But this is him coming in the flesh temporarily, as he did many times, I believe, in the Old Testament. So it's not the Father, because we saw in our oneness series, no one has seen the Father at any time. Uh, but Jesus has made him known by coming in the flesh and being a perfect image of the Father. And so we see here, we'll start in verse 16. And the men rose from there and looked towards Sodom. This is talking about the angels and Jesus. And Abraham went with them to send them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation. And all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. This is the verse I want you to pay attention to in verse 19. For I have known him, in order that he might command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord, to do righteousness and justice. The Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. And so we see one of the purposes of fatherhood right here in this, what the Lord says about Abraham. Uh, that he may command his children and his household after him. The first thing I want to say to the men here and the, who are fathers here today and those who are future fathers is society as a whole tries to destroy fatherhood and manhood. I remember it was going back when I was a kid. I used to watch The Simpsons, and Homer Simpson was made to look like a fool, a bumbling, stupid fool. Ted Bundy, or, no, Al Bundy, not Ted Bundy, Al Bundy, same thing, made to look like a bumbling, complete fool. Someone just sits in front of the TV and drinks beer all the time, and just stupid as can be, good for nothing. You see, it's all throughout our society, it's gotten worse. I mean, that was back in the late 80s, early 90s. It's gotten a lot worse since then. And we have this, this effeminate thing when it comes to men that men are not the head of the household. Um, if it's not that, well, maybe the woman of the neck, not the head. They can manipulate and turn their husband or where they want. And we see kids begging and pleading their, their father to do something, and he tells them no, and they keep on doing it. Eventually, he just gives in and folds. And it's this thing where these, these men are just weaklings, and we're not called to be weaklings. We're called to be men, strong. We're called to command our children and our household. I don't beg my wife to do something that I, I want her to do. I don't beg my children to do something I want them to do. I don't bribe them to obey me. I tell them to obey me. And they know that that's the way it works. It's not because I'm just some kind of type A person, authoritarian either. It's not just who Kerrigan is. This is what the Bible commands me to be. That I'm to command my house. And I have this authority, not just because of the position I'm in, although that, that should be enough. I have this authority and boldness because I have God on my side. And this is what God commands me to do. This is what God commands me to be. And so he, he, he was setting apart Abraham... And since part every father, every godly father, that they may command their children and their household after them. This is why. This is why you're to command your, your, your children and your house. That includes your wife. And they may keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice. And everything I, I, I strive to, everything that I do when it comes to my family, 
It's number one, to get them saved. Number one. Number two, to make them holy. And number three, to persevere to the end. So everything I'm doing is, is, is gearing towards that. Oh, I want my wife to persevere to the end. Oh, I want my children. Yeah, my children got saved. I only have one child. He's only four years old. He's not really to the point where he can be saved. All my children are saved now, except for him. And I'm like, well, that doesn't mean I'm to the finish line yet. I need to continue to work with them. And I'm continuing to, to do things in their life. To, I'm being very thoughtful about what I'm doing with their lives and their time and how I'm teaching them and what I'm putting before them and how I'm leading them to, to ensure as much as depends upon me that they're going to make it to the end. And so I'm commanding them, my wife, my children, I'm commanding them that they might keep the commandments of the Lord, keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice. Malachi 2.15. Of course, in order to have a biblical family, uh, you must, as a husband, as as a man, you must first be married. And in Malachi's time, there was treachery going on amongst married men. They were putting away their wives for no good reason. They were dealing treacherously with the wife of their youth. But verse 15 tells us why God made this covenant between husband and wife. But did he not make them one, husband and wife? having a remnant of the Spirit? And why one? Why marriage? Why make husband and wife one? He seeks godly offspring. He seeks godly offspring. You see, that the foundation of being a good father, a successful father in God's eyes, is firstly a successful marriage. A godly marriage. <clears throat> Where the wife's in submission to the husband. The husband is washing the wife in the water of the world. We'll that here in a minute in Ephesians 5. But this is, this is the foundation for a, being a good father is having a team. Because I'll tell you straight up, I can't do it by myself. I need my wife's help. I need her to, to be in her place and do the things that she's supposed to do in order for me to be successful as a man to do what I need to do for my children and for my wife. And if she wasn't doing the things she's supposed to do, I would be so overburdened and so overwhelmed by trying to make up for things she's supposed to do, that I'd be a horrible father. I, I wouldn't be successful. My children wouldn't be where they are, I wouldn't be where I am. So it takes a team. There's a oneness there. And that oneness, and us being in our roles in this marriage, is what will produce, as much as it depends upon us, is what will produce godly offspring. But it takes two. It takes the two that become one to produce the godly offspring that we need. Otherwise, there's going to be compromise and it's going to flow into your children. It will flow into your children. No doubt in my mind about that. I've seen it myself, my own two eyes, in other people's lives. And then, of course, another purpose for, for fatherhood we found in Third John verse 4. It's basically the same thing being repeated, but it says, I have no greater joy than to hear my children walk in truth. Third John chapter 1, verse 4. I have no greater joy than to see my children walk in truth. And that gives me such great joy. You know, that, that's, and the Bible says all heaven rejoices over the sinner who repents, over someone becoming a child of God. And we get to experience the great joy that God experiences when a sinner becomes a saint, when a sinner repents and becomes right with God, we get to experience that when we see our children walk in truth. We experience the joy of God, the joy of the the Father. When we see our own children walk in truth. And so the purpose of fatherhood, to command their children and household after them to, to keep the commandments of God, to walk in His ways and to bring forth justice and righteousness, to produce God the offspring, and to see our children walk in truth. So as a father... Those are, that's, my, that's my goal right there. Because of my children. Those are, those are my goals. If they become successful musicians, but they don't walk for Jesus, then I, I think I failed. I, maybe I, I mean, obviously, I can't blame myself for everything. They have, they're going to become adults. They're going to make their own decisions. But if it's because I'm not doing something 
then shame on me. Okay? Now, obviously, we can't take responsibility for everything our children do. Our children, they can depart from the faith, they can fall away, and that's going to be on them. But we need to check ourselves to make sure we're doing everything that we can do in these situations. So first, uh, we talked about, looked at the purpose of fatherhood. Now let's look at how not to be a father and husband. Oftentimes, we talk about how to be, we'll look at that here in a second, but oftentimes it's good to look at how not to be something, and it'll teach us how to be something. Turn to Genesis chapter 3. We see the first husband uh, failed from the beginning. Verse 6. So we see Eve is being tempted here in Genesis 3, 6 by the serpent who is uh, possessed by Satan tempting her to disobey God. She gives in. And then Genesis 3, 6 so when the woman saw the tree was good for food, that was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And here's the damning part for the husband. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. So, a godly husband in this situation, what's he going to do? Say, Eve, don't listen to him. You stop listening to him right now. That's the enemy of your soul. Come over here and be with me, and I'm going to tell you what you should be doing. I'm going to remind you what God told us to do. We're not going to do that. We're going to walk by faith that God said, don't eat from that tree, and we're not going to eat from it. That's what a godly husband will do. But a weak, ungodly husband will say, that looks good too. I mean, she ate it first, and she liked it. Well, okay, honey, I'll take some, and I'll eat it. You see? So he... He harmed himself. He harmed others because the, 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 you know, the, con- the, the punishment that came upon Adam from this. Every time, men, you have a little sweat on your eyebrow, you can thank Adam. You can thank Adam for, dis- for obeying his wife. And it's a reminder to you. Every time you sweat, let her remind you, don't follow suit. You're to be the leader in your household, not your wife. You see what happens when a wife leads? It's, it's, even if she wasn't leading him into sin, she's not supposed to be leading him. He's supposed to be leading her. <laughs> you are the head, not the other way around. That's what 1 Corinthians eleven three tells us. The head of woman is man. You lead her in righteousness. Do not let her lead you. And you are called to be called by God to be the leader of your house and nobody else. Not parents that you have or she has. Not other men not other women. I've had in my life, I've seen other women try to go through my wife to tell me what to do. To tell me how to run my household. To manipulate. And it takes discernment to see it and to not fall for it. But, and for example, if my wife was working a job and I say, we're not going to do this and her boss said, well, you're going to do this or you're going to get fired. Well, who's she going to obey? You see the conundrum there? You see the pulling of back and forth? The tearing there, the attempt to tear apart that? And so we need to make sure that we are the ones commanding our our wives and that there's no other, and we're the ones commanding our children. You know, my son recently started working a job. And let's say it was a job that had hours on Sundays. And I told him before he started working, son, you're not working on Sundays. Absolutely no working on Sundays. And then they try to get him. They put him on schedule for Sundays. Now he's torn. He's like, do I obey my dad or do I take these hours? I might lose my job. Well, who's he going to obey? Well, he might lose his job. Well, so what? So what? Where does the Bible say obey your boss? Who is the main authority in your life as a woman of God? Your husband? Who is the main authority in your life as a child? your father, and then your mother. That's the way it works. And we need to beware of these little foxes that try to get in the vineyard and destroy and corrupt and bring harm to our lives. So beware, you are the head, men. The head of your wives, the head of your household, you are the head. Nobody else, you are. Of course, you have an obligation before the Lord to obey Him, to follow Him, 
and to do as he commands you to do. And if you do something stupid and your family's following you and you don't hear the Lord right, not paying much time, uh, time to him in prayer and in the word, well, then you're to blame. But that's the place we're in. That's the sober responsibility we have in this life. Genesis 16. And 16, verse 1. At this point, God had already made a promise to Abram on what he was going to do, giving him a son, giving him a promised inheritance, a land inheritance. This is many years later. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. And she had an Egyptian maidservant who was, whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid, perhaps I shall attain children by her. Abraham heeded the voice of Sarai. Then Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. And Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. So he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. Then Sarai said to Abram, My wrong be upon you. I gave my maid into your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between you and me. So Abraham said to Sarai, Indeed, your maid is in your hand. Do to her as you please. And when Sarai dealt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. So whose voice did Abram heed on this occasion? Was it God's? No, he heeded the voice of his wife. His wife had grown tired of the promise of God not coming to fruition. The promise that God had made to them. He was growing, she was growing tired of waiting. And obviously Abram was too because he gave in. He gave in and listened to the voice of his wife, which was opposed to the voice of God. And we have a mess on our hands now. A mess. And people are suffering because of this mess. Years later, people are suffering from this mess. Ishmaelites and Israelites clash constantly. People are suffering thousands of years later because of this one stupid decision where he heeded the voice of his wife instead of the voice of God. He didn't trust God by faith and walk in the steps of faith like he was supposed to. God was going to bring, bring forth the past, bring the past what he had promised. Is God a liar? Got a man that he should lie? God spoke to Abram. He said he's going to do something for him, and he didn't wait. And he, he must have gone, grown weary himself, and then people are affected. And now Sarai blames him. And you know what? Rightly so. Because he should not have heeded her voice. That's his fault. It's her fault she came to him with that, that nonsense, that influence. That's her fault. But it's his fault he heeded her voice. He is to blame. It's, it, what she said there is actually accurate. The Lord judged between you and me. You know, Abram, you should have not obeyed her voice. You should have obeyed and taken heed to the voice of the Lord as he commanded you. So when your wife grows tired of following God's will and wants to take things into her own, own hands, don't give in. Don't give in. It will just cause you all kinds of problems that you will despise. And she will despise later on. You see, if my wife, God forbid, were to rebel against me and to want to do her own thing, I need to keep following the Lord. I need to. And, and, and if I don't, she will despise me even more later on because she will suffer repercussions from my disobedience and my heeding to her voice instead of God's voice. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. It says, And you, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. And then Colossians 3.21 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. 
So Ephesians 6, 4, do not provoke your children to wrath, fathers. And Colossians 3, 21, fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. How can you provoke your children to wrath? Well, here's some ways I've noticed uh, throughout the years. Playing favorites. Having a favorite child. Treating one better than you treat others. Not disciplining them when they need it. Just being distant, being absent, not giving them the correction they need. When you do discipline them, you discipline them in anger. That can make them bitter. That can provoke them to wrath. That can discourage them. Disciplining them unjustly, maybe not looking into the matter enough, not really realizing exactly what happened and making a judgment too soon based upon appearance or based upon the little, under, on that little knowledge you have, and it ends up being an unjust discipline and judgment because you didn't get the facts straight. I've seen it happen, man. I've seen children become bitter over this. Bitter. Because parents do this to them. Being too harsh on them. Not allowing the punishment to fit the crime. The punishment must fit the crime. The more serious the, pun- the, the crime, the more serious the punishment. The more prolonged they continue in a certain crime, the greater and stronger the punishment should be. That's the way the father is. And we'd be like the father. Us fathers, you'd be like the father. That's the way he deals with us, and that's the way we need to deal with others. <clears throat> Not giving them physical love. It's important. You know, most, a lot of us men, we were not raised in a household where we got that physical love from our father or that physical love from our mother. But our children, everyone naturally has a desire for that. Some more than others. We must give them the physical love they need because, listen, if you don't, and that's what happened to my sister. My parents got divorced when I was seven and a half, eight years old. My sister saw my dad maybe once, twice a year after that. And she desired physical affection from her father. And he was not even around to give it to her. And when she saw him, she would just smother him because she just never got it all year round. And what did she do? She became promiscuous. She became a fornicator. Because she was looking for that love from someone, from somewhere. And she wasn't getting it from daddy. So she went to someone who would give it to her. That's provoking the wrath. That's discouraging for a child not to get those things. Another way you can provoke a child to wrath or discourage them is you enable them to disobey. You enable them to sin. You make excuses for them in their sin. You look past their sin. You look over them. You justify their sin. You're enabling them to continue in sin. That's a discouraging thing. Because yeah, children, they truly, no matter what anyone tells you, they truly want boundaries. They want to know, this is where I can go. This is where I can't go. If I go over here, I'm a sinner. I'm over here, I'm okay. They want to have those bound. They want to have that protection, that guidance around them. And if you're not giving it to them, you're letting them go outside all the time, then they're in danger all the time. They're not feeling safe, not feeling secure, and rightly so, because they're not. So that, that can be discouraging and provoke them to wrath as well. So these are some ways not to be a husband. These are some ways not to be a father. Let's look at some ways of how to be a father. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. You know, all of us have had in recent years interaction with the nation of Israel and Jewish people, and so the Shema is a, a very important thing to them, and rightly so. And people oftentimes focus on verse 4 and 5 and 6, but 7 through 9 are important for us as people of God. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your Lord, our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words that I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And so talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontless between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. You know, as fathers, 
It's important we do Bible studies with our children. We do devotionals. We have a time of prayer. But, you know, that's we can't just check that box. Oh, did my job. That was it. No, you see, it's all throughout the day. We can't compartmentalize and segment off our lives. Bible study time. Oh, do whatever you want time. Prayer time. Do whatever you want time. The whole thing should be focused upon the Lord. And I, I don't know about you, but I'm constantly looking for, for chances to teach my children some truth, teach them from the Bible, uh, bring back some biblical principle that we've, we've, we've learned before and I've taught them before, to bring about some memory verse we've been learning. You know, I'm constantly looking for ways to teach them these things, to see them, to help them see. It's not just an hour every day. It's our whole life. The Lord is our whole life. And everything should be focused upon Him. Whether we're sitting down in our house, whether we're walking by the way, whether we're lying down, whether we're rising up, or we're driving in the car, whatever we're doing, our focus is upon the Lord. And so it's not just about having devotionals and Bible studies, it's about teaching them that our life is completely focused upon and, and looking towards the Lord. Proverbs chapter 3. Verse 11, it says, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son in whom he delights. So I, I strive to teach my children to love discipline, to love correction, to even go to the person who corrected them, who disciplined them, and say thank you, because they're doing it for the sake of their own soul. And they need to realize it's for their good. They don't despise correction. They don't despise judgment. They don't despise chastening. Because that's from the Lord. And that's what you need. We all need this sometimes. And the Bible says that if you, if you deserve some kind of correction and God doesn't correct you, that you're an illegitimate child. And so we dare not treat our children like illegitimate children. And have, have, have them have this illegitimate child mindset. I mean, I, that's the mindset I have. When I had my stepfather growing up and they first got married when I was about 11 years old, I despise any kind of... I said, you're not my father. I despise correction from him. And I'd pull that card out. Me, you're not my father. Ha ha ha. You're my stepfather, not my father. Pull it out. And I was acting like an illegitimate child. I despise his correction, his judgment. And I want my children to understand that you don't despise correction and judgment from God or from your parents. You're thankful because you don't know it all. And you need some redirecting. You put back on track because sometimes you get off track. You get put back on track. And we need not have them act like they're a red-headed stepchild that doesn't like their, their, what their stepfather is giving them. That's the, way illeg- that's the way an illegitimate child acts. That's the way someone acts towards God when they're not really his child. That's the way God acts towards someone when they're not really his child. Proverbs 13. Lots of good stuff in Proverbs for parenting, being a father. Proverbs 13, 24. He who spares his rod hates his son. But he who loves him disciplines him promptly. The old saying, who spares the rod spoils the child. No, it's you hate the child. This world had to believe, well, if you ever use any kind of physical discipline on a child at all, you hate them. That's not loving. That's hateful. Well, they're backwards. They're Isaiah 5.20. So the Bible says, the Bible says you spare the rod, you hate your child. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll be the Bible over modern day psychology. I'll be the Bible over modern day supposed parenting experts. Who is the parenting expert? The father. Who is the best, ex- best example to, to us fathers? The father. Who tells us how to be the best fathers we can be? The father. He says, you spare the rod, you hate your child. Then it says, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. Now promptly means several things. It means this. It means you're doing it quickly. There's swift justice. Not waiting around. 
oh, I'll, I'll spank them later. I'll discipline them later. When I get around, then you forget about it and they never get a splint. And then they, go, they got away with it. And there's no correction. And you know what happens? They begin to impute what they're getting from you that that's what God's like. They think because my father's like this, that's what the father's like. He lets me get away with stuff. Is that what the father's like? They don't get away with a thing. God sees it all. And he deals with it properly. I've met, run to many people throughout the years who the, their father was an angry person. Um, he wasn't there. He was absent. He may have even molested them. And they impute that to the father and think he's like that and will bl- even blame him for it. That's the way it works. And so we need to make sure we're disciplined promptly, quickly, consistently, and early. You know, so people will say, well, oh, he's a four-year-old. Oh, he's just a little bit, he has a little bit too much energy. He's just four. Oh, he, he's five years old? Oh, yeah, he's, he's just a boy. Six years old? Oh, she's just sassy. That's all she is. No, she needs to be spanked. No, he needs a rod. No, they need discipline. They need it early. They need it promptly. They need it consistently. Otherwise, you're sending the wrong message to them. You're telling them, listen, that's okay. I'll beg you. I'll bribe you. Just obey me, please. I'll tell you, man. Is that the way the father is? Is he begging me to obey him? Is he bribing me to obey him? Absolutely not. If I don't obey him, there's quick punishment. There's since the beginning of me becoming a Christian, as early as I, I had it then. It's like the first couple years of a Christian, well, God doesn't punish me. God doesn't discipline when I do what is wrong. He doesn't correct me. He doesn't chastise me. No, that's not true. From the very beginning, if I did wrong, I felt the chastening hand of the Lord in my life. I remember one time I was, I was even contemplating sinning in a certain way. And I would go play basketball early in the morning at this church, 5 o'clock in the morning, 6 o'clock in the morning. And I was contemplating this certain sin. Tempted. I hadn't even done it yet. I was being tempted to sin in a certain way. I was contemplating actually doing it. And I, I'm, a, I'm a young guy. I'm 20 years old, 21 years old. I go up for a rebound. All of a sudden, a shot of lightning down my back. I fall to the ground. I have to crawl off the court. I was in so much pain. And I said, Lord, I knew it was sin. I said, Lord, I repent. I repent. I'm not going to do it. I could get up and just play again. Like it was no big deal. I don't ever have back problems. I have a strong back. But God was bringing this chastening hand upon me even early on. He didn't let me have a free pass for his th- first three to five or six years. It was early. It was immediately. And it was consistently. And you know what that showed me? I didn't say, God, you're so hateful. Why'd you do that to me? No, I knew he loved me. That told me he loved me because he didn't want me to go that way. He wanted me to go the right way instead. Proverbs 19, 18. Chasten your son. Proverbs 19, 18. Chasten your son while there is hope. Do not set your heart on his destruction. People think they're just being all buddy-buddy with their kids and I don't have to spank him. We're just friends. We're just best friends or mothers and daughters. We're just best friends. I don't have to chase in her. You're setting your hope on, you're setting your heart on their destruction. That's what you're doing. Sure, there's going to come a point in time when they're going to be out of your household and it's more of a friendship than it is a maybe, maybe than correcting them. But even then, you're still a parent. You're still going to offer correction. It's on a different level, maybe. In a different way. Because they're outside your house. Maybe they're married at that point in time. But there's a, you know, there's a point in time when you keep this up. You don't discipline your children like you're supposed to. You keep it up. You're setting your heart on their destruction. You know, that's why you do it early. And consistently. And quickly. Because you're setting your heart on the hope. That they'll take heed to the instruction you're giving them. Whether into their head or through their backside, you're taking heed to this instruction and that they'll walk in it and do it. And your hands are free from their blood if they turn back. Proverbs 29, 15. 
The rod and rebuke give wisdom. But a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. You want your child not to bring shame to you? You want to be able to walk into Walmart and do shopping with them, throwing a fit and fussing over every little thing they see and say, Mom, can I have it? 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 And embarrassing you in front of the whole store? Well, you better rebuke them and you better use the rod. If you don't, well, shame on you. You, you deserve the shame that you're going to get from them acting that way because you won't take heed to the Word of God. The rod and rebuke are not worthless. They give wisdom. They give wisdom to a child. They show them, don't do this. Don't go this way. I mean, there's times, it's, it's kind of funny, but there's times when be in store, and I remember when our children were younger, and we walk, and now we see this child throwing fit. My child would say, that child needs a spanking. They knew. I mean, I can walk into Walmart with all eight of my children. No problems. I see people walk into Walmart with one or two child, children. They're like, they can't handle it. And they'll go to check out, and they say, I don't know how you do it. And I'll, if I were to say to them, well, you need to spank them. Give them the rod. They say, oh, I... I can't do that. Okay. Have your cake and eat it too then. Go ahead and eat the fruit of your ways. You don't do what the Bible says? You're going to give God some wisdom now? God's the one who's all wise. He's the one who's omniscient. You think you're wiser than God? Well, do it your way. I'll tell you, I got some success. I'm not boasting it. I just did what God told me to do. That's the only reason why I have some success. And people will tell me how obedient our children is and they'll say well this is what you got to do to get get it that way it's not like a formula but there's certain things God tells you to do and if you don't do those things there's no change that's going to happen I I, I can't do that well okay I, I, I gave what the word of God said it's on you now and if your child brings you shame later on or your child dies in an early age because of foolishness that's bound up in his heart and you won't drive it from him by the use of the rod it's going to be your fault. But it's going to be on your hands. Proverbs 22, 6. Now this next verse, I believe people misuse it. Okay? Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Let me tell you this straight up. I don't care what anyone tells me. This is not some guarantee, friends. Okay, so, so if you see your child depart from the faith, don't you dare blame yourself automatically. Sure, you can examine yourself to make sure you did everything you can do. But listen, don't put a burden on your shoulders that the Lord has not put there. I want to tell you this straight up. I examine myself all the time as a father. And if right now, Today, all seven of my children are Christians depart from the faith. I would have no blood on my hands. I tell you that. With a clear conscience. And people take this verse and say, well, if someone departs from the faith later on, then you didn't do something right. I don't think so. If we're going to say that, what are we going to say about God? Because isn't He my Father? Can I depart from the faith? Well, you haven't been a good father. That's why I'm departing from the faith. There's some sinners who actually make that accusation against God, but it's not true. But there's a training. You see, there's a training involved here. I think training, I think someone's coming alongside someone. They're walking through it step by step. I think back to when I was in the, in the military, and I had a supervisor who taught me how to lift weights step by step. Every little thing I could possibly learn, he taught me how to, how to do it right. The right slow motion. You're not jerking it up and down. going to hurt yourself. Slow down. Slow up. Start small. Work your way up. If he didn't do that, I could have hurt myself. And when we train our children, it's not just like we do this one thing an hour a day and then, oh, go off by yourself. Go play some toys. Go sit in front of the TV. You know, go, go do whatever else. No, there's a training. It's constantly coming alongside them. And I know, I know it's, it's difficult. We all have busy lives, other things we must do besides raise our children. But listen, if I'm going to forsake anything, it's not going to be raising my children. I'll forsake preaching the gospel. 
as much as I do. I'll forsake be being a pastor if I had to. I'd forsake a lot of things before I forsake teaching my children and training my children. But I know God's called me to that. Otherwise, he wouldn't have given me eight of them. And then if he, back to Ephesians 6, 4. Look at the second part of this verse now. Look at the first part about not provoking them to wrath. It says, And you, fathers, bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Once again, there's a training involved. There's an admonishing involved. You know, we're one of the greatest influences in our children's life. And as Proverbs, one thing I do think Proverbs 22 6 is saying is that the best chance our children have of actually making it to the end is that we do our job. That's the best chance they have. Because we ought to be the greatest influence in their life. The most consistent influence in their life. We get the most time with them. Or we should anyway. Get the most time with them. We have an influence in their life. Not their peers. People who are the same age as them. I'm thankful my children have some godly friends. But I'm the, I, I'm, I am to be the greatest influence in their life. Nobody else. And when I'm doing my job, they have the best chance of survival later on. Because we're giving them a good, solid foundation to build their lives upon. Now they can get a good, solid foundation out. You know, picture a house, a good, solid foundation. And we start to build upon it, and then they go back and destroy it all. They could do that. But I'm to be there to help them build that strong foundation. Ephesians 5, 22. I said earlier... The foundation to having a godly and biblical family is that there's a godly marriage. Verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife. And also Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ also loved the church. And gave himself for her. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. That he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. That she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. Just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each let each one of you, in particular, so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. And so when it comes to, to marriage, we see parenting, the great example is the father, to us, his spiritual children. When it comes to being a husband, the great example is Jesus Christ and how he treats the church and what he's done for the church. If your wife isn't submitting to you in all things, then she needs to know that she's in sin and she needs to repent. And no uncertain terms that she's in sin and needs to repent. She needs to see that you are on the Lord's side primarily and not her side. And she's a no, without any shadow of doubt. I'm in sin right now. I'm in danger. I have no peace with God. I'm harming my marriage. I'm harming my family. And she's no, she needs to repent. And you need to be Jesus to her. He laid his life down for the church. He washes in the water of the word. That he may present her without spot or wrinkle. Or against this thing. But holy and without blemish. That last song we sung today talked about how he, uh, on the day that he died, he ransomed his bride. You see, Jesus died for his bride. Why? To make her holy. And so my question is, how far have you gone to make your wife holy? How far have you gone to make your children holy? Would you, I mean, lots of men are willing to 
lay down their lives physically for their wife and for their children so they won't die. But what's worse, physical death or dying and going to hell? Dying and go to hell is worse. And so if we're willing to lay down our physical lives for our wives and our children to not die physically, then what should we be willing to do to make sure they're holy and blameless, without spot, without wrinkle? Fast, pray, teach, rebuke, encourage, serve. Are you doing everything you can to ensure your wife is holy? To ensure your family is holy? And the other thing I want to point out here is in this, this passage that these commands, the commands given to the husband and the commands given to the wife, they're not necessarily interlocked. See, if the husband's not doing his part, the wife can't say, well, you're not doing your part, so I'm not going to do my part. And the wife's not doing her part, the husband can't say to her, well, you're not doing your part, so I'm not going to lay my life down for you, I'm not going to serve you. No, they're mutually exclusive. Why would you think in your mind, that disobedience warrants disobedience from you. Why would you think in your mind that disobedience from somebody else means, well, I can disobey too? That's a foolish way to think. That maybe that was Adam's mindset in the garden when Eve sinned. But it's, it's foolish. And you're to do what God calls you to do, whether your spouse is doing what they're, called, what they're supposed to be doing or not. Next thing I want to mention here for a second on children, let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. As I said a second ago, many men, especially here in patriotic America, they're so focused on protecting their children physically, which is important, I believe. If you want to harm my children, come through me. That's all i got to say. And uh, I'll lay down my whole life for them. But what about us being in the last days? 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemer, disobedient to parents. That's in there, huh? Unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying his power, and from such people turn away. What are you doing for your children to prevent this from happening? What influences are you allowing in their life? How are you protecting them from this coming onslaught? How are you preparing them for what is going to come? You know, this guy, I've read people who are preppers, they'll, they'll get all kinds of sniper rifles, and they'll store up all kinds of food, and if anyone ever comes for their family, they're going to be up in a you know, second story or third story of their house, they're going to sniper people from far away. But listen, man, you're going to run out of bullets eventually. You know, but what about their spiritual life? You know, if my children die, some kind of tragic thing, and I couldn't stop whoever was trying to kill them, but they're in the faith? Well, praise God. They made it to the end. That's my goal. That's my job. To help them make it to the end. What are you doing to prevent this, this passage from becoming them? Because it's quite possible, and I've said this before, and it's come to pass, not prophetically. I've said it to people before, this could be you, and it became them. I'm here to tell you again, this could be you. Don't let it become you. And my heart is set, as much as it depends upon me, to make sure my wife and children don't become these people. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. It says, Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Now, one of the first things I taught, I taught it in Kentucky, too, before we came here. I taught, the first thing I taught here when we got here was friendship. So I knew. God has spoken to me. One of the main reasons we were coming here is that my children could have godly friends. 
He's answered that prayer. I believe he'll continue to answer that. But along the way, there'll be counterfeit answers to that prayer. People will come along who are not good influence in their life, who are not meant to be their friends, and they'll be tempted to become friends with them. And they'll make a bad choice if they give in to that temptation. I'm constantly telling my children about this. Anytime we go out into the world, my son's working now a job, I said, listen, you've got to watch out for who you're going to be friends with. Watch out who you let influence you. Because it'll corrupt your good habits. And your habits really become who you are. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 14. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? What part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I'll be a father to you and you'll be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Be careful who you let influence children. Be careful who you let your children hang around. Be careful. What fellowship does light have with darkness? You know what's going to happen eventually? The darkness will encompass the light and they'll become just part of it. Become just a part of it. So be careful. The answer is right there. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do you feel your light growing dim? You feel the darkness crowding in. You think you're going to give in. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. And as fathers, we are to watch over our children and watch over what influences they have, how much influence they have to go to darkness and protect them from it and do whatever we can to do that. Romans 12.9 You know, what I found is that we can teach our children the Bible all we want. We can say all the right things. But listen, if we ain't living it out, if we're being hypocrites, your, what will affect your children more is what they see, not what they hear. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. So we need to make sure we're being a good example to them in front of them in public and in private. Anyone could fake it in church for, for a day or so. But what are you like at home? When no one else is around. No one's looking. Are you a different person? Do your children see that you're a fake and a fraud? God forbid. First Corinthians 11, 1, the Apostle Paul said, Imitate me, just as I also imitate Christ. See, the Apostle Paul, he wasn't a hypocrite. He wasn't Romans 7, 14-25. He wasn't a hypocrite. He said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. He's saying he's imitating Christ. And he wants you to follow suit. That's why we should be as fathers. We should be the best example our children see. And they should want to follow suit. 1 Corinthians three eighteen. Little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. We're to be the best. We're to be a good example as children. And if we become hypocrites in front of them and they see it, they might become bitter. It might cause them to turn from the faith. And finally, I'm going to give you some warnings, men, fathers, and future fathers. Take heed. Warnings. Beware of manipulation from your wife and or children. Your wife is not only not the head, she's not the neck. Beware of manipulation. If you could say the main temptation men have in the world is lust, we can say the main temptation women have in the world is control. Control. Whether it's the way they dress and controlling men's eyes and their minds and the way they treat them, or it's manipulating someone to get what they want, it's control. 
Beware. Second warning, don't enable your wife and children to disobey you and God. Not just God, but you. Don't enable them. You know, if, if, if I had a, a son or a daughter who was involved in drugs, addicted to drugs, and I kept giving them a free place to live, a free place to eat, I'm probably just enabling them. That's all I'm doing. I keep on pumping into that. They're stealing from me. Come back in, sure. Stealing from me. Come back in, sure. Threatening my life. It's enabling them. That's all I'm doing. I'm enabling them to keep being that way. They need to feel the suffering of their sin. The suffering their sin causes. They might take heed and repent. Right? So need to feel that. Don't enable your wife and children to disobey you and God. Now you become accountable too. Be consistent in how you lead them. Don't be like a roller coaster. But the Lord said this. Then the Lord said this. The Lord said this. Then the Lord said this. And listen, they're contradicting. You've got to be consistent. Don't be a roller coaster. Be a consistent climb up the mountain. Yeah, there'll be a little fall here and there. Once in a while, you keep climbing up the mountain. Let them see your consistency in your faith. Let them see the consistency in your life. And then they'll want to emulate it. You see the consistency and the steadiness? That shifting ground? Like an earthquake? You see the steadiness. And you're walking on a sure footing. They're going to want that. They're going to want that. Do whatever you can to lead them to Jesus and help them live holy lives. Whatever you can. Make whatever sacrifice you need to. And in the end, you will not regret it. You do whatever you can to lead them to Jesus and help them live holy lives. Give them opportunities to be exposed to this wicked world and its influences while still under your shepherding and protecting hand. Okay? I'm not talking about throwing them to the wolves. I'm talking about when I go out to preach the gospel, I bring my children with me. I'll go to the gym, I'll bring some of my children with me. And that's a soft exposure to this wicked world to see what it's like before, listen, sometime they're going to be out from under your shepherding hand eventually. If you haven't exposed them to anything, they're going to have shock. They're going to have a shock to it. And they might just give in. Be exposed to a little bit of time like under your shepherding hand, you're there alongside them, watching over them, protecting them, warning them, admonishing them, encouraging them, rebuking them. There they need. You're watching over them. Let them be witnesses in this wicked world. Give them opportunities. I mean, listen, we're all called to be witnesses, but listen, if you just keep your children at home all the time, who are they witnessing to? Maybe an unsafe sibling, unsafe parent maybe, but who are they really witnessing to? You talk about witnessing, you go out and witness, but you give them the opportunity to be a witness. There's got to be opportunities. I said a second ago, make sure you do whatever you can to to get them saved and keep them holy. Here's another thing I'll say. Kind of the opposite end of the spectrum. Don't enable them to be dependent on you so much spiritually and they don't have a faith of their own. Don't enable them to be so dependent upon you spiritually that they don't have a faith of their own. Remember, I mean, if you have a Bible study twice a day, I mean, what time are you giving them to have their own Bible study by themselves? Where they're seeking the Lord in prayer. They're reading his word and the Lord is speaking directly to them, not through daddy. Because eventually, you keep that up. They're going to be so crippled spiritually, so dependent upon you spiritually, they move out, they're not going to know what to do. They've got to learn to have their own Bible study by themselves. And listen, i got, I got some older boys here, they've got to learn to lead Bible studies. Because someday soon, they will be leading Bible studies with their own wife and children. <laughs> So don't make them so dependent upon you. If they can't stand their own feet spiritually, by the time they move out, you're partially to blame for that. Don't ever beg or bribe your children and or wife to obey you. Yet, encourage, praise, and reward them at times when they do. Isn't that just like our Father? He doesn't beg me, he doesn't bribe me to obey him, but sometimes when I do, he rewards me. He encourages me. He blesses me. 
That's what we need to be, too, to our wife and children. Okay, so above all else this morning, fathers, you're called to be like the father of fathers. And oftentimes when I am parenting my children, my father in heaven will remind me of how he's parented me. And the times I've made mistakes in parenting, my father would say to me, what if I did that to you? It's rebuke. It's an exhortation. I've got to repent. And above all else, fathers, we know the foundation for a biblical family is a biblical marriage. We're called to be like Jesus as husbands. 